Okay, I guess we can get started. It seems to be uh, people have decided either to come in or out. <laughs> um, well, thanks, thanks a lot for staying this late. You know, um, there was uh, already one presentation after lunch, and you know, I'm the second one on the row, so please hang, hang tight. Also, I came from Europe, so I, I was wondering if uh, it would have been better to keep the morning slot for the European people, so <laughs> I don't fall asleep myself here. <laughs> but yeah, um, my topic today is uh, uh, enhancing hypervisor and cloud solutions using embedded Linux. And really what's behind it, um, I'm covering a lot of the same topics as we have been talking today, but uh, maybe a bit, bit of a dis different angle to it, because I come from the embedded background. So I'm trying to reflect on these same, same issues that have been discussed today, like going over the cloud components and different solutions and problems in the areas. But uh, I try to give, give a bit more of a kind of traditional uh, embedded type background on it. So this is what I cover. It's a long, long dump. Uh, actually, we even had a longer dump of the whole abstract here. But really what I'm going to talk about is uh, the first chapters uh, about the different components uh, that we've chosen for our solution architecture uh, for our cloud solution and cover the main highlights of those. Then I'll go into uh, uh, like the problems we see in this field. It's really, really a lot about the virtualization and hypervisor capabilities, but uh, also a lot around the concepts that what have been also discussed today earlier. So uh, what, are the, what are the kind of uh, market needs and how can we solve those? So we will cover different different areas, uh, going a bit deeper maybe, maybe than the earlier ones, like uh, logging and tracing of different full stack solutions and so on. So this the agenda looks like in detail. First, I cover the, the solution stack. Uh, we have a couple of main architecture slides, then talking about QM and KVM. Uh, gladly, I don't really have that much on the actual hypervisor solution, QM and KVM, because that's been covered today. You know, I have to agree with Dirk Hornell going going last after everybody else kind of had <laughs> at their at their talk already. It gives me a kind of different sense to what I'm gonna talk about here. So I'm gonna reflect a bit what the earlier presenters have said and you know maybe skip some of the things that have been kind of already beaten beaten down a couple of times today. We have a couple of real, kind of what I what I like to think hypervisor solutions, KVM and Linux containers, then we have a uh, couple of other key aspects what we see in our space that are being required by, by our customers. And finally, the two chapters where, where, where we will end with further work on the topic, like how do we see this all going forward and how could we collaborate to make this all better? So choosing the right architecture, <clears throat> you have to choose the right components, otherwise you end up with a solution stack that is not always optimal. So uh, this guy is, for real, it's actually coming to our Friday night uh, out with, with the guys. <laughs> so just this picture. But yeah, it's, uh, it's quite important. So our, our hypervisor solution stack uh, looks like this. So we have chosen uh, a lot of the same, same components that uh, are becoming kind of de facto in our fields, both on the kind of enterprise and also when we talk about embedded cloud. Maybe a couple of words, words about that, that concept. You know, in, uh, in my view, more embedded cloud is something that is not necessarily something that runs on uh, off-the-self hardware in data centers or things that you can run on top of your desktop. It's a bit something that is more embedded, embedded in that nature that it's uh, uh, customized for a particular purpose. Uh, it's not always public. It can be hybrid or a closed cloud for a particular, um, let's say, customer ecosystem. And some of the things I'm going to talk about here are, are maybe on a bit high level, so uh, without going into the exact details how we implemented certain things, because uh, there are so many ways of doing this. But uh, we, will see. we will see some of the things we will, we will dig a bit deeper and something we will keep on a bit higher level. So really, we have, we have two different uh, ideas for running a hypervisor. One is the KVM. Uh, everybody knows about KVM. It's a, it's a standard full full fledged hypervisor. Another one, with what we still promote, and uh, Montavista has been one of the uh, kind of uh, early adapters, and we have uh, used uh, Linux containers, uh, LXC based systems for a long time. So we still feel it, it has a place in, in this field as well. 
LXC provides some advantages that KVM is not, not providing in that, that nature. And in the following slides, we will go into that a bit deeper. Then we have uh, uh, additional components inside the OS layer, uh, base services box there, open vSwitch and open flow, uh, two things related to the kind of SDN concept, also related quite much about the cloud. So uh, we will cover those in, in the following slides as well. We feel that these components are also key for creating any type of cloud based on open source components and also in this kind of embedded nature clouds that we are building in these slides. Career create services uh, also coming from our background in Monta Vista, we feel that the base system must contain some of these as well. And also it, it needs to be highly available, could have good tracing facilities, good logging facilities, be secure, and also related to this, it's a CGL aspect, carrier grade Linux. So typically when our software gets deployed, it's, uh, it needs to uh, kind of adhere to this specification. Uh, it's basically uh, kind of mandating all the, all the previously mentioned aspects of, of a base operating system. Then inside the hypervisors, we run the guest containers and guest VMs. In some cases, you run parts of OpenStack inside a VM. In some cases, you run, run it on top of the host. So the solution stack here is not uh, exactly going to be meant like you have to build it exactly like this, but it's more like conceptual, which components we can kind of mix and match and build solutions. The, the box on the far right, a management and provision in software and services. Uh, what I see, this is uh, earlier presentations we have talked about a lot of the, a lot of the projects and all the components that sit above OpenStack, so even higher. And uh, what I, talk about this box here today in this presentation is how can we combine all of this together with the, the stuff that is coming from the, from the bottom, from the base operating system and all of these layers. So we can create a solution for the customer that is a best fit for their particular purpose. It might not be, uh, might, might not be the same for every customer in all cases. So we can combine this base solution and sort of uh, based productized services to form a uh, kind of one size fits all if you, when you go up to a higher, <coughs> higher level. Sorry about that. Guess I have to kind of move the mouse here a bit. Okay, starting with QM and KVM. Um, I will not beat the dead horse too much about this. It's, uh, it's been discussed today. So it's a hypervisor uh, integrated into the Linux kernel. Um, what maybe has not been said that much today, maybe reflected in some of the earlier presentations, is that uh, based on our data, it's like uh, about 80, 85% of uh, companies starting or using virtualization nowadays uh, are either aiming to use KVM or are using it as their primary or secondary uh, virtualization uh, hypervisor, hypervisor provider. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be quite important going forward. Highlights about KVM, what it provides. Um, key, key aspects, it's uh, on x86, it's best reported currently in Linux. Uh, KVM patches uh, for ARM are, are being developed and uh, it's, it's more or less available. I think in mainline, you have a good support for ARM uh, in some, some sub-architectures nowadays, but it's really gonna be, uh, I think, later part of this year when ARM will really, really kick off with KVM. QMU, uh, is kind of a component of KVM. When I talk about Q QMU and KVM, it's kind of the same thing. So KVM uh, often means like the combined uh, hypervisor, but uh, have, what is, is uh, kind of the sum of its parts, QMU and KVM. Some parts, uh, some of the highlights here are actually coming from the QMU part and some of them from the KVM side. But really what QMU, for example, provides is the live migration com capabilities. So in the latest releases of QMU, you have very good support for bringing, a, bringing a, a virtual machine to another host and you know, kind of doing it on, on the fly, but you talk about live migration. Uh, the second sort of hypervisor solution, which is not really a hypervisor, uh, is Linux containers. What this is, is actually based on the kernel namespaces um, that uh, John Corbett also referred to yesterday that have now added this user namespaces providing holes to security. We'll come back to security in the latter slides. But uh, really what it does, it constrains uh, a particular container so that it's kind of invisible from the other containers, whereas it's still running inside the same system. 
it's still the same kernel. It doesn't replicate any of that stuff. And you can also, to some degree, you can also share other parts of the system between your containers. So it's, it's much more efficient. And uh, how we see this uh, being used in some cases is that either you can have a sort of plugin components that ex ex extend your cloud hypervisor layer uh, in some degree. And sometimes um, what the market uh, needs also is uh, this kind of lightweight hypervisor that actually will, will create, uh, instead of guest VMs, will create containers that have much per better performance. They basically run on native performance if you round out uh, the performance numbers a bit. Then open vSwitch, the third key component in the solution, is an open, open virtual switching component. Uh, what it of course does is, you know, it, it switches traffic back and forth to virtual machines without using the Linux stack. Uh, what's really interesting about this is that, uh, in my mind, for example, it provides much better facilities for, for live migration. When you're using, using a cloud uh, hypervisor plus guest solution with open vSwitch, you're able to use the open vSwitch kind of abstraction to abstract out your network configuration. So when you uh, move the guest, guest virtual machine to another host, you can more easily kind of match the network configuration of that, that guest VM. With, if you do it uh, like uh, mapping, mapping sort of network interfaces to the actual host side uh, API going, going to go down, down uh, further down level, uh, you will have to kind of, uh, kind of jump through a couple of hoops before you're able to actually move the virtual machine over because the environment needs to match exactly what you have on the other side, sort of. Uh, also interesting about Open which it has supports the open flow uh, standard and protocol. And uh, we see this, this is now an important part of the SDN movement. So being able to control uh, your switch using open flow and maybe flowing that control downwards to the actual physical layer is an advantage of, uh, of this open switch. It also provides, uh, to some degree, performance. Um, in some of the studies we've seen, Open which uh, surpasses, uh, in some cases, the, the Linux bridge uh, performance. But uh, as in the previous presentation, at, at least it reflects the same kind of capabilities. So you don't at least lose performance by using Open vSwitch. And it also allows bandwidth control. So you can control the ports bandwidth, uh, that uh, the ports that you have allocated to different virtual machines. You can control their bandwidth, you know, to re create resource and quality of service uh, scenarios. OpenFlow, then uh, it, uh, in some cases, I see open OpenFlow being uh, equal to software-defined networking. But really, the, the, the idea behind is that you have a controller, and then you have a target. So the controller is uh, sort of a centralized place where you manage your uh, sort of flow tables and everything, the configuration. And then you use OpenFlow APIs uh, to stream that control down to the OpenFlow targets. Either those are real physical switches or they are, they are software components implementing the OpenFlow API. This is something that uh, for us in Monta Vista is interesting besides also the cloud movement. Uh, so uh, coming from the embedded background, OpenFlow could be considered only for, for us to be a provider of an OpenFlow API in any case, so that you would have an OpenFlow compatible device, if you think about the legacy traditional embedded device. But in, in the cloud, um, it's, it's re really, a, really a key thing uh, that is hot at the moment to be able to scale up your services. So the traditional um, static configuration of fruits and flows, as we see in the previous presentations with NFV, uh, alongside with SDN, uh, that's going to be the future to allow us to scale our networking infrastructure to support the new, uh, new amounts of data. Also, key advantage of the of the open flow movement now being standardized is that it's actually it's driven by the end users, like Google and Facebook, and not the not the vendors of uh, of uh, hardware and software. So this is what I what I see, for example, in the automotive side, the Gen EV consortium was, uh, in my mind, partly successful because the, the OEMs were also part of the standardization. So the people who are kind of bringing in the money who get to call the shots also. So that's the that's a kind of aspect to a success of such a consortium. 
than OpenStack. Uh, I think I saw this picture a couple of times today already. So uh, what OpenStack is, it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I always use the word cloud framework, but it's maybe cloud OS or some other term could be used for it. It's uh, when you look from our perspective from the embedded side, OpenStack is sitting far up, to, up, the, up there and it provides APIs down, down that we need to take, take use in our devices and our solutions to be able to create a, a cloud solution. So what it, what it really is, it's a set of APIs that was just described. Uh, so uh, what I see key, key points for integration are the three major components. Uh, the, the Nova Compute plugin basically needs to be implemented by, by any, any cloud solution taking use of OpenStack. Then you have quantum networking that plays well together with, uh, with the open vSwitch and uh, sort of networking facilities inside your solution. Then you have Keystone identity plugin that I, I find interesting, maybe because of my background in security, but you can implement uh, interesting things using this kind of authentication mechanism. When you think about, you know, coming from the hardware up, you have TPMs, all kinds of interesting devices that you can take into use in a sort of more custom cloud provider scenario. And the Keystone APIs can be, can be kind of routed down uh, to your system, when you, then you can take, take use of these uh, more hardware related devices. Then they have other plugins. Uh, maybe I don't go into those that much. Uh, those were just described basically around, around the storage, um, storage handling and provisioning of images. One that is really interesting now is uh, also they have a plugin called Savannah uh, that provides a Hadoop service. So uh, kind of when you, when you look into this, this field for the past year, it's like a year ago, uh, I think it was just in the presentation, like uh, how far has OpenStack gone in a year? So if you take a year back, uh, then you would talk about SDN and, and big data and, uh, and cloud and all this hypervisor things, especially in relation to the embedded field. So this, is, uh, this has really been moving quickly. And now when, we, when you see OpenStack kind of being the middle point also for this, you could, you could integrate your big data and big data APIs using Hadoop also to the same framework. It's, uh, it's really uh, advancing rapidly. And what does it provide? It's, uh, it's really a key service uh, in our solution stack today, that's OpenStack. But such a component like CloudStack or any of the others available there is really, uh, in my mind, it's required to create this kind of uh, maintain a, a cloud framework that you can actually maintain and use in the, in the field. If you have to rely on a lot of different components, you kind of come up to a solution that the guy was riding his bike earlier here. It's, there's so many components I've seen today in this uh, like four or five presentations. That you, if you start building, so one, one block does this thing and one block does this thing, it's, uh, it's, it's not going to work in the long run. You need something that is more uh, kind of hierarchy and man, uh, ability to, ha to have manageability inside the system. Okay, so that was the, the first part about the key components and architecture. And the idea was uh, more or less to describe what, what are the components we have chosen today and uh, what are, what, what's their place in our kind of you know, embedded cloud solution. Uh, this part here aims to uh, describe what do we see kind of, uh, kind of highlighting the problem areas, uh, mostly problems, maybe a couple of solutions as well. But uh, we will go through the, the key areas that I think we need to solve in able to have this kind of an embedded cloud that we can, we can offer realistically. And uh, what, what are we doing? What have we been doing? And what, what are we doing regarding those problems? This is also related to hypervisors that I often like to use. Like uh, when you add levels of abstraction, it uh, usually doesn't make your system go faster. So this is the, the guys here have, have created that kind of cloud solution. So uh, how do we get over those, especially related to the real time, that picture is, is nice because, you know, when you have a guest operating system, you typically don't at least have better real time than, you know, running your real time related apps in the, in the hosting hypervisor. This is one of the key things to us, you know, the MontaVista background is always you, when you think about MontaVista, it's real time first, and then we, we, we go to the customers also and, you know, but it's true, we have, we have here also these kind of demands. So real time inside the guests, that's, a, that's an important factor in some, some cases. 
we will see a bit more bit more about that in the coming slides what exactly that does mean then the guest network throughput uh, for sure that's uh, that's one of the probably the one thing if you have to choose one thing what you need to have in your hypervisor that's probably throughput inside your guests uh, using different means uh, we'll come back come back to that as well and memory access speed um, things that affect everything uh, memory access speed is um, is something that is um, hardly to hard to put uh, a single thing uh, what what it means and what you need to do about it but really um, coming from our background again memory access speed in today's hardware whether it's a uh, uh, uniform memory access or new system you have a bit different means of kind of uh, going around that in the guest operating system typically it relates to creating some sort of affinity with the memory kind of data locality with the memory and its accessors so uh, in a new system um, it was what, what John Corbett again described yesterday you have different mechanisms so you have to keep uh, even the scheduler can to some, some degree do that for you but again kind of embedded focus kind of uh, targeted application you can do more than you can do in a general sense so when you when you go for a to a scenario where you know what the hardware is, how it's being used, you will be able to create scenarios using, a, you know, locality of access, using the affinity mechanisms in the kernel, using custom handling of, you know, the memory, memory locality functionality inside. You'll be able to enhance the memory access speed to some degree. And uh, when, when your memory accesses are faster, you will usually get the performance improvement in almost any sense in, inside the system, especially this kind of uh, data in intensive applications tend to benefit from this enhancement. Going further, a uh, couple of other use cases. Multi-operating system support. And uh, by multi-operating system support here, I, I mean, you know, not, not only Windows, Windows 7, Windows 8, Windows XP. I mean things that are coming from the legacy of, of our customers. Things that are, you know, cryptic and strange, uh, real-time operating systems, uh, Linux, Windows, of course, versions of Linux that were ancient, because uh, you know you can't throw the legacy away usually, and uh, it's it's much of a heterogeneous environment where we move in. Security and isolation, uh, also in the hypervisor, inside the guests, and inside the whole cloud thing. Uh, that's good, good points in the previous presentation. I will also touch some of the same things maybe a bit different aspects, but uh, security and isolation will be more and more important now that this cloud movement is taking up. You have different things that you have to address regarding security than maybe in a traditional operating system. And forward portability, that's uh, also in, in addition to the multi-OS support, the forward portability aspect uh, is, uh, maybe it has been touched a bit, but uh, I feel that uh, in, in some, some um, verticals you have a bit different problems regarding this. So being able to ascertain that you, you can move across different types of hardware, different architectures, also in the application space. And uh, also when you talk about your guest mechanisms for bypassing network traffic, for example, you need to be able just not to use one interface. And then when you go to the next generation of hardware, uh, that might be something that you go from MIPS to ARM or x86 to ARM or something else. Uh, you can rewrite the entire software to take advantage of, you know, inside the guest, use that hardware in particular. You would like to have an abstraction API here. And a final part in this, uh, what we feel custom hardware adaptation is something in, in, in the embedded cloud. Uh, again, we will be able to take advantage of, of the legacy from the embedded field to make a cloud solution work better in general. It's hard, again, it's hard to put that exact thing around this, but ad being able to adapt, use the, use the real-time footprint and so on, what embedded Linux comes kind of brings to the field, you will be able to create a more competitive solution in, in certain scenarios at least. And full stack management interfaces, uh, again, I, I feel, you know, my, my opinion has not changed. Even, even today we discussed in several of the presentations, we, we brought out new things to me. I learned new things today. But my opinion still hasn't changed. I think this full stack management interfaces, and I, I actually could draw the box to be in a bit higher there. That's uh, one of the key problem areas, I think, because there's so many solutions, and it's the thing that sits on top of everything else. So in order to make your cloud uh, solution competitive, you need to need to solve all of these issues. 
and uh, we feel uh, that also the embedded uh, embedded uh, Linux movement can also help there. We can uh, we can use our expertise from the bottom up to look at these things. You know, guys who work with IT um, IT houses, you know, enterprise solution can look at look at from above what the, what really the customers need, uh, like uh, big government uh, organizations and so on. But maybe we can help from taking a look from from bottom up. Okay, so uh, the next next slides are going into some of these, most of these, in a, in a bit more detail, uh, covering some cases. So one example, you know, the going a bit deeper into the real time scenario. The problem here is so you know, typical real time is that you have an interrupt that you have to react to in uh, in a certain latency, and uh, often these latencies are pretty uh, pretty small. Uh, depending on devices, depending on applications, you have latencies of various degrees. The problem with the hypervisor, uh, uh, adding the hypervisor in between, of course, comes from there that the hypervisor usually has to act first, first when it uh, propagates the interrupt inside the guest. In order to serve an interrupt in the guest user space, you have to go through the host uh, kernel space at least, and then the guest's kernel space in order to be able to schedule a thread that actually serves the interrupt. So you have, uh, you don't only have the worst case response in the, in the hypervisor host, you have also it in the guest. And putting those two worst cases together, you have a really, really bad case. So um, <clears throat> in some cases we've seen that uh, this will be, you know, totally off the chart. Um, you can do numerous things. One simple thing is that you can bind your, uh, bind your uh, virtual CPUs to particular CPU only, so that you run one guest per CPU, which helps in many cases, simple solution. What we really uh, are doing or have done is that we, we use our, in our cloud, cloud solution, we, we integrate the preempt RT patches. Also quite a, quite a simple solution when you say it like that, but uh, the preempt RT patch set is quite big, uh, but it, it provides very good performance inside, inside the hypervisor. And combining that together with some of the advantages we're going to talk about a bit later and together with the handling of the IPI interrupts that we're improving and uh, now with the upcoming work in the kernel where you remove the timer ticks kind of away from the course if you have to use affinity or binding uh, this will give us much better real-time response totally in a different scale by the way on this we, we actually have run some some benchmarks that, that show that this, uh, this do work, uh, of course, again, in the embedded nature, it's uh, one thing is not, you can't really compare uh, apples to apples or oranges to mandarins even. Uh, every case is so different. Network throughput, the base problem area uh, regarding network throughput is that, uh, you know, when you start doing networking inside your guest, you can use the same mechanisms, it looks the same. Your application accesses the uh, guest, uh, guest kernel mechanisms for putting stuff inside the virtual interface, which then, then kind of appears inside the host virtual interface or host backend. And this gets mapped, uh, sent over to the an actual network interface card. So what we really need to do here is we eliminate context transitions, uh, kind of a high level solution overview. We eliminate this, we put push traffic directly to the kernel. And often, uh, as we will come to later, you will, you will push traffic directly to the actual device from the guests like using solutions like NetMap, DPDK, uh, exposing these inside the guests. You, you basically have to do this for the user plane traffic to be able to actually um, manage with your, your needs and requirements. What we're also enhancing is uh, quality of service capabilities inside also the, the lower layer of the system. We can use open vSwitch and the higher level systems to some degree, but we also need to enhance this underneath so that we will be able to at that kind of hard level QA package and create quality of service uh, underneath the guest kernel. And then digging a bit deeper on the multi-OS support. So uh, really what we see here is that uh, many of the, of, uh, in, of the customers or players in our vertical see that uh, there's significant legacy. Multiple operating system can usually be achieved by some degree of parameterization. Uh, typically these operating systems that are proprietary to uh, these uh, players or uh, virtual, virtualized operating systems like VxWorks or OSC 
are, are not uh, trivial to manage. And such an embedded cloud needs to support these operating systems. So we often need to do customization, um, maybe for the hypervisor, especially in the side to guests, to be able to get those to run nicely with our solution. And uh, the issues we face here is that, you know, the IO performance is one thing, of course, those uh, operating systems are used to run on bare metal. So they have very good access to the actual hardware. But the good thing regarding that is that usually when you do this, it's the use case is to consolidate your uh, legacy operating system on a new hardware. So typically the new hardware can perform much better. So it's, it's usually kind of a non-issue. The real issue is real time uh, because some of those operating systems are used to uh, like nanosecond or one microsecond response times because they run on exactly the, the bare metal. There's no real OS, it's like a main loop. So some of those operating systems have been designed so that they will fail dramatically if you will uh, kind of go over certain, certain boundaries in your response time. So that's uh, the real time issue comes to play here that we covered earlier. And security and isolation, like I mentioned earlier, we will face new uh, new kind of threats and new attacks in the in the cloud domain. And this multi-tenancy that was covered earlier, we run multiple companies inside the same same hosting hypervisor. And let's say that one of those companies is you know Amazon billing, you know, a huge company, and another one is like a, a garage shop, uh, Jack and the Dog or something. And these guys uh, they run out of money and they find a vulnerability inside their guesting, guest par virtualization or something, they will be able to breach the hypervisor and run a, run a route on your hypervisor or have other privileged access. If you can access the data or use a denial of service uh, for this, it's, it's gonna be, gonna have drastic results. So um, uh, actually, I don't really have visibility from these guys like Amazon, how they're actually dealing with this, but you will think that uh, when you go to a, from a physically separated host, you only put them into a kind of cloud solution. You have to have pretty nice guarantees for security. It's these kind of uh, issues will will come up there. So how we how we go over those? We need to make sure that our hosting operating system, of course, is you know managed with uh, with the CVEs, public vulnerabilities. We need to run uh, secure processes. Uh, have have a when when the when the and end user is uh, launching their device, they need to start to start from the secure approach from the start, you know, create security use cases and abuse cases and those things in order to address this. Um, I only have SC Linux as word as one one bullet there that was nicely covered in the in the previous talks. But uh, I also like this. I, I have been talking about SC Linux a lot earlier um, in, in these kind of conferences and uh, it has been one thing from our perspective, as, at least in the embedded field, that never kind of, uh, it's been always kind of floating in there, uh, but it never took off in a large way. It's probably being used more in the kind of IT, IT world. But we feel that there are certain cases, a couple of years ago, I was talking about SC Linux in the automotive space, where you can use SC Linux to harden containers. And now I feel with, together with the s -word, you have a real, uh, real use case where you can really get good benefits from using this kind of mandatory access control. Yeah, so it not only exploits, also the data needs to be invisible. So even if you can't really breach it, uh, you can't really see your packet traffic either. So this is, uh, when you look at the containers, um, this is maybe, maybe something that uh, really needs to be taken, taken a careful look. Especially now, <laughs> since yesterday, John Corbett mentioned about this root access, user namespaces. Somebody chooses to use containers for this kind of cloud cloud system in order to harden your code or do code review. Security policies, I, I like this slide a lot. It's really simple, but you know, if you, when you start thinking about security in the beginning, it really can have an effect. Like, uh, of course, you know, firearms prohibited, he won't do anything. It's like, uh, but if you start, you know, designing security in from the beginning, you tell people that needs to be secure. It's kind of explicit instead of, you know, being implicit. Actually, in one of one of the customer meetings I had recently, uh, we had some discussion about security, and then there's yeah, of course, it needs to be secure. That's uh, in a way it's the wrong approach. You need to kind of say explicitly, my system needs to adhere to this. It needs to be secure in this and this way. Otherwise, you will kind of rely on you know people's perception of security and it will just be there. 
Uh, the final part in this section, uh, full stack management interfaces. Um, and what I mean about this is, uh, is basically the, the APIs OpenStack provides, you know, bottom, you know, implementing the plugins, uh, the API, extending the APIs that uh, OpenStack provides uh, now. So collaborating with the OpenStack project in the free scale presentation earlier, that was really interesting that they have actually created the uh, OpenStack plugin to allow this kind of NFV uh, applications to be created using the OpenStack. So this is exactly what I'm talking about here uh, to some degree. Also, some degree, I feel that this full stack management interface is, is something that comes also from within the kernel of the hosting hypervisor, uh, so that you will be able to access the higher level things and also the lower level things. You kind of, uh, in my mind, you need to have a hierarchy where you see the world in the beginning, kind of zoom in like in Google Maps, you zoom, zoom into your one uh, kind of hypervisor host component. And in there, you see individual virtual machines. Inside the virtual machine, you see different applications. Inside the application, you see libraries and you know virtual memory maps, and then you can use virtual machine introspection, this type of toolings to see exactly the memory bytes and bits that are going inside inside that virtual machine. And um, what I feel that this kind of the more uh, abstraction, the more layers you build in a software, the more uh, debugging uh, problems you will tend to have uh, between those layers. So when you use a debugging tool, um, having this kind of monitoring and managing interface that goes across layers is very important. Maybe it can be different solutions, but you kind of need something to bind it together. And uh, libvirt uh, is one thing. Uh, libvirt does a lot of things. Um, of, of course, of being open source, you can extend it. And this is what we are also doing. We're working on all of these. And we are you know, going around this. Like, um, like also was discussed many times today is that it's hard to make a roadmap because it moves so quickly. How can you create a roadmap that goes like four years ahead if, you know, one year uh, things like OpenStack and SDN and Big Data and everything just kind of boost like four times more, uh, more contribution and four times more, more companies around OpenStack. A couple of years ago, uh, there basically was no OpenStack. Okay, uh, really further work on the topic. Um, I only have really a couple of bullets. Then we can, then we can talk about if you have uh, totally differing views or something, something else you think that's good, then let's go, let's go over that. The way forward, I know, give way to penguins. That's a, that's a kind of nice, a nice picture is that being go, going around here in, in this conference a lot. Uh, yesterday, Linux is taking over the world and you know, going at these these things every year, it's uh, it seems to be you know you know going that way. You know, we're taking over big data and cloud now, and the KVM is coming and so on. It's really uh, different things here. So uh, regarding real time, um, this kind of scheduling problem is uh, is quite quite difficult to solve actually in a general way inside the guests uh, and the the hosting hypervisor. There are some some effort being made inside um, this kind of cooperative scheduling. Uh, regarding real time also that, and the use of resources. So uh, cooperative scheduling basically meaning that you will expose some of the internals of the guesting operating system to be able to schedule everything in a much finer granular way, kind of para virtualize the scheduling inside the guest domain. So you will be able to, instead of, you know, lifting one virtual machine on a pedestal, you will be able to create uh, domains within that virtual machine. Say that there's one application that, you know, once in a year, it needs to act very quickly, but uh, when it does, then it needs to get the priority regardless of everything. But if you have that and the other, other parts of that virtual machine are not doing anything that's important, how can you kind of solve that scenario? Is the adaptation of applications. Um, that is something that's ongoing. There's work done, uh, a lot of different, different movements uh, and talk around it. So there are a couple of options what we're thinking about. There's this open event machine, uh, sort of uh, API for abstracting out um, things like a uh, lightweight executive, uh, simple executive, going lower level, things that access the hardware accelerators directly. If you can find an API to access those in a hardware independent, operating system independent way, that's a major advantage. NFV, maybe it's, uh, it's, it's a bit different. Different bullet would be better. But uh, NFV, uh, that's a really new thing that seems to be ramping up pretty quickly also. Uh, in the embedded space, we need to address that as well. 
performance and manageability. Uh, well, OpenStack really, uh, even when I wrote this slide, it seems to be going old. So like uh, every, every hour you have more stuff that you could put in here. It's really the full stack management interfaces is what I mean by this bullet here. So we really need to uh, wrap our heads around how can uh, sort of the lower level and the higher level play together. Then a couple of uh, really like concrete things that we are doing is that, you know, KVM uh, coming from the fast boot space uh, in, in, in Montavista, you know, having a legacy in automotive fast boot and such things. Uh, we think about simple enhancements like uh, virtual BIOS enhancements, getting your stuff to boot and shut down faster, you know, uh, re remove some of the kind of extra baggage that each KVM guest needs to carry, uh, optimizing that for a particular purpose. And resource allocation and guarantees, you know, when you stop and start virtual machines, you will uh, sometimes run into scenarios that, you know, your resources are not available anymore there. You need to create a certain kind of caged environments where you know that what you have available and whatnot. And uh, using containers, you can also create this kind of IO MMU usage. Uh, it doesn't have to be explicit to KVM. You can increase further the kind of uh, compartmentalization by using uh, using some of these virtualization hardware features within the same kernel. Yep, thank you. Um, so uh, basically, what I feel that uh, there's a lot of discussion ongoing, a lot of, uh, lot of solutions. So uh, I presented one, one solution stack that we have been thinking about here in Monta Vista, coming from our background with our customers and their needs. It might be a bit different depending on who, who you ask what kind of solution stack you should build. Um, well, yeah, questions and, and comments. Are we looking at the right things? Are we looking at the wrong things? Uh, questions about uh, some of the things I 